Hey everybody, it's Miss Villegas trying to hook you up with some extra notes about World War II. Uh, I'm going to start from the beginning, like any other story, you need some background. So we're going to talk a little bit about Between the Wars, although Miss Panzer and I have already kind of gone in depth with it. So this is a map, it's showing you some things that were going on between the wars in Europe. Uh, if you just pause my, uh, my voice here, you could pretty much take down whatever you want that's written in the little uh, blurbs there. So we're looking at uh, different movements, whether they're political boundaries or revolutions. There are change, changes that are occurring as a result of what happened with World War I. After World War I ended, the destruction of Europe was unprecedented. There's um, massive destruction in the infrastructure of many of the countries that had the battles going on there and of course you know a country wasn't touched that's the United States so that's part of the reason why also the United States comes out after World War One as a uh, superpower. And I'm sorry if you're hearing little Mina in the background but uh, she's up so she's, she'll be uh, making her way and saying hi. Anyway this guy if you haven't recognized him he's Albert Einstein and he's doing some uh, equation on the board which looks like a lot of fun but um, anyway, a lot of his discoveries were going to help us lead to uh, some awesome science discoveries, but unfortunately it also helped us uh, get to the atomic bomb, which has been argued over time as being justified with dropping it on Japan, which we'll get to hopefully next week. Okay, so Albert Einstein was actually in Germany, but he's going to flee the country and he's going to end up coming over into the United States. Uh, which allowed us to get much needed help with ending uh, World War II with his findings of the atomic bomb during the Manhattan Project. I know my class has gone over some crazy things with art going on uh, between the wars, and you see new ideas like cubism, surrealism, even dataism, which is a funky, crazy one, but... Uh, Anyway, it's supposed to show the changing of people's attitudes towards life, and some of it reflects the horrors of World War I, while also showing you some of the uh, mixtures of traditional beliefs. So here's some other ones that are in a dreamlike state. Kind of scary and creepy. I hope my dreams never look like that. But we also see uh, a new way for America here. We're looking at the Roaring Twenties, and obviously they're enjoying themselves after the victory of World War One. Okay, so we're looking at a map here and it's showing the different powers that had existed uh, towards uh, during World War One and the end of World War One. But uh, what I want to point out to you here is that not only will the United States become the wealthiest nation in the world after World War One, but um, it will also create the League of Nations, which it doesn't join, but it's goals, uh, one of which was obviously to keep peace uh, and to prevent war, is not going to be as effective or at all effective, which will help, you know, Hitler and Mussolini and uh, the Japanese rise in imperialism. Now, at the same time the United States is rising to power, we got Japan all the way on the other side of the world there, uh, also gaining wealth during World War One because their role in World War One was actually selling supplies to a lot of the Allies. And this actually increases their position to the point at which they become the strongest nation in Asia. Yes, believe it or not. So um, while the European nations are struggling to rebuild and pay for the war, um, other nations are actually benefiting from the war as seen below. All right, so we got a little peek at the Roaring Twenties in a previous slide, but some other things maybe that you weren't thinking about was that, you know, people are enjoying the new jobs in creating consumer goods. Uh, automobiles are being created. They're super popular and inexpensive, so people are definitely spending money on, money on that. Uh, you know, here, here's an advertisement showing how uh, men went around and tried selling the uh, cars door-to-door. And we also have the Americans enjoying not only buying products, but also going out on the town, entertaining themselves with jazz, uh, and also enjoying some sports there. We see two of the most famous baseball players ever to have lived. 
Now, we talked about this as well, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there was something called the Dawes Act or the Dawes Plan, which actually helped out Germany with their reparations from the Treaty of Versailles and also helped us get a buck as far as getting our loans repaid from Britain, France, and, uh, you know, with some interest. So I think we're the only country that could figure out a way to make money off of other people's uh, debts from a war that we helped them out with in the first place. So unfortunately we go from the roaring 20s and we enter into the depression and the stock market crash really ends the roaring 20s for America and sends you know the uh, the rest of the world into a depression as well. Uh, it the you know, stock market crash triggers the depression worldwide and also allows for dictators and totalitarian leaders to come up into power. So the desperation of others, you know, they'll, they'll look to anybody who's going to promise them a better time. So people like Hitler and Mussolini, although they used fear and terror to control the masses, they also did keep some of their promises by offering jobs and lowering taxes and increasing you know public transportation and infrastructure and they they were successful with that the problem is nobody really saw how they were doing it and um, part of it was yes the United States was helping them out but once the depression hit the Dawes Act kind of went south and also Hitler was creating jobs by getting rid of the Jews and making women go back to the homes uh, in, in, in my class, we talked about the women's role in Germany, and many of them were encouraged to have babies. They got awards for however many children they got. You know, one of the highest awards was the Gold Cross, and, you know, you, you received that for having seven or eight more, you know, or more children. And uh, if, if you're a team player, ladies, you're going to want to try to get that cross to impress Hitler and your country. Because, again, the way these guys ruled... Uh, was not for the individual, for the individuals, for the state. So, with the women leaving the workplace and the Jews being forced out of their work, you're definitely going to see some jobs opening up for um, other citizens. So, many people were totally fine with these dictators coming in and uh, fixing things. But before we get to the rise of those totalitarian leaders, we do have to take a moment and talk about the Weimar government in Germany, which the Germans were hating on, not only because of the depression coming along, but also because these are the guys who actually ended up signing the Treaty of Versailles. So there's resentment towards them uh, with that. And of course, the Italians were super upset because they didn't get what they wanted from joining the Allies during World War One, which was the land promised to them in Austria. So a lot of bitter resentment out there in the world towards the Allied powers coming from the Germans and the Italians. Okay, so to break it down even further, we're seeing a map here about some of the totalitarian leaders throughout the world that were rising to power. Uh, all the way from Spain into Japan. So we see Francisco Franco, who is going to lead his uh, nationalist army to rebel against the government of Spain, which Mussolini and Hitler were in support of. And we talked about the bombing of Guernica and Pablo Picasso creating his Guernica peace uh, as a result of those attacks. Of course, Hitler is going to also rise to power along with Mussolini, which we were just talking about. And then over up in Russia, we see the Russian Revolution, and as a result, Lenin uh, creates his rule there. But unfortunately, Lenin dies, and Stalin weasels his way into power and uh, takes over in the Soviet Union. And then, of course, we have in Japan Tojo Hideki, who is actually the shogun, he is not the emperor, and although the emperor is seen as the all-powerful godlike ruler, he is actually not the main man behind all that is done, and uh, the, sh the shogun is, is the real guy who's got the power, he controls the military, and is the one that is actually seen. You know, uh, the, the emperor is usually, you know, kind of behind the scenes, stays to himself, becomes a uh, figurehead of religion. So as time passes, these guys all come together and join themselves in what is known as the Axis Powers or the Axis 
coalition mm -hmm. and uh, what they all have in common is they all want to imperialize, they all want to increase their nation's power, and they're going to do it with violence, they're going to use imperialism to get what they want. Obviously Japan is uh, requiring natural resources to fuel their industry and power, so Japan's going to go into Manchuria and eventually into China and in, into a lot of other south, southeastern um, areas in, in Asia. Uh, Emperor Hirohito, in the end, is going to um, try to kill himself, uh, and that kind of goes along with the Japanese mentality of war. You know, they it's it's win or die, and uh, he actually does try to kill himself, but he ends up missing all of his major arteries, and they end up fixing him, you know, medically, and they put him on trial, and they eventually execute him in 1948. Uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity and he was the uh, person behind the planning of, of Pearl Harbor uh, and you know the, J the Japanese were the earliest test of peace during the 20s and, and the earliest test for the League of Nations and, and the League of Nations is going to fail repeatedly over time as you can see in this timeline here in many situations Italy, Japan and Germany will test the League of Nations and the League of Nations is like eh Maybe next time we'll do something about it. So they, you know, the League of Nations will publicly declare that they're against these actions, but they actually don't do anything. Uh, Mussolini, weird story. Um, you know, he grew up from you know the parents of a teacher. Or, well, his parents were te a teacher and a blacksmith, and um, he was kind of a weird kid, I guess you would say. He actually stabbed somebody at school when he was going there. He ended up getting suspended and. Supposedly, he was some sort of like a homeless guy in Switzerland and got arrested. But, you know, when he got his act together, he joined the war in World War One, And he became one of those veterans that was resentful towards, you know, the outcome of war. And so he gathered up veterans and formed a new political party and eventually came to power after he marched on Rome and um, took down the king of Italy. And he would create the black shirts. Um, much reminiscent of the red shirts that were created by Garibaldi during the unification of Italy. And then last but not least, oh Hitler, Adolf Hitler, and his Fuhrer-like rule. Um, he was seen as uh, a charmer, uh, and uh, you got to give it up to him. I mean, he was a smart guy as far as planning the controlling of mass amounts of people while also being super hateful towards a particular race and Hitler's mentality was basically nature is cruel so I can be too and that was his excuse for uh, his social Darwinist ways towards what he would consider weaker races so again here's some reiteration of what we've been talking about in Japan and where they went to and why they went to there. One of the most famous attacks was the rape of Nanjing, which I'm not going to get into because um, it's interesting enough for you to go look up on your own and I've talked about it in my class and I don't want to get super depressing about what they did, but the Japanese were super cruel in uh, what they did to the Chinese um, in this spot here. Uh, Mussolini, when uh, he takes power, not only does he promise to make the trains run on time and open up jobs, but he also promises that the Mediterranean Sea will become their lake once again um, when you compare it and go back to thinking of when the Roman Empire once existed. So he's definitely going to try to take over other places in northern Africa and all the other locations you know, around the Middle East, or I'm sorry, around the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So again, it goes without saying that the Japanese and the Italians were the first two aggressors during the time that is known as between the wars and the age of anxiety. So these two countries are definitely imperializing, and this kind of shows Hitler like, okay, so um, two countries are going and invading other innocent places, and they're not getting you know slapped on the hand, so hey, maybe I could do it too. And this is what's going to lead Hitler into uh, remilitarizing the Rhineland. This is going to lead to him annexing Austria in his Anschluss. And then it's also going to add to him uh, annexing the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia.
as seen here, in case you were wondering as far as geography goes, where the Rhineland is, which is located here, and then we see parts of Czech.